Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started just because we have a very good um, webinar here for you today. Um, good afternoon. My name is Victoria Lancy, and I'm the Rural Education Coordinator with Michigan Center for Rural Health and will be facilitating today's program. I would like to welcome everybody to today's special topic grand round on children and youth with epilepsy which is brought to you by the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan and the University of Michigan and the Michigan Center for Rural Health. Before we begin the um, program, just a couple reminders. If you are logged into the webinar portion and have the computer and have computer speakers and a microphone, you can listen to the audio through them. If you are listening to the program via a telephone via, and via the audio number, handouts are located on our website for you to follow along. Handouts are located on our website at www.mcrh.msu.edu. Click on the education link on your left, scroll down, click on special topic, grand rounds, find today's date, and there you will see attendance forms, presentation, and the evaluation link. Attendance forms need to be emailed, faxed, or mailed into the Michigan Center for Rural Health Office. The evaluation must be completed online. Please complete these forms within two weeks or by April 20th. If you would like to ask a question during the program, please type it into the chat box so you do not forget it and the presenter can address it during the Q&A time. Our presenters um, today indicate no conflict of interest and the planning committee did not have any conflicts. There is no commercial support for this program. With that, I am pleased to introduce Cynthia Hanford, who is a nurse education and advocacy specialist at the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan, and Dr. Suchata Yoshi, who is a doctor at the, um, of pediatric neurology at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you. With that, I'll hand it over to Cindy Hanford. Uh, thank you, Victoria. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. This is a very, very exciting and important topic. Uh, Dr. Joshi is a renowned pediatric epileptologist at a level four epilepsy center at Mott's Children's Hospital. Myself, I'm an RN advocate, education specialist. I've been with the Epilepsy Foundation in Michigan and we cover whole, the whole state as a nonprofit. Uh, my association with epilepsy is, uh, I've had it uh, since 83, so I teach not only uh, from an education RN standpoint, but also as an advocate standpoint. And uh, Dr. Joshi, do you want to say a little bit about your background? I'll be glad to thank you for the introduction, Cindy and uh, Victoria. Um, as uh, Cindy just mentioned, I am a pediatric neurologist with training in epilepsy. And as you will see later in the talk, that makes me an epileptologist at the University of Michigan. I take care of young children, infants, adolescents with epilepsy, both straightforward epilepsy as well as treatment resistant or what we call medically refractory epilepsy. Um, I do a lot of teaching of medical students, undergraduates, residents, and epilepsy fellows. Um, I am affiliated with the American Academy of Pediatrics and currently I am involved in a large uh, national project for children and youth with epilepsy. The AAP is a national coordinating center for increasing access to care for children and youth with epilepsy. The state of Michigan has also been intimately involved with this effort and uh, I am involved with the state of Michigan telemedicine work for children and youth with epilepsy and we'll hear a little bit about that uh, in today's presentation also. I am really excited to be doing this talk along with Cindy. I think with Cindy's background of being an educator, an advocate, as well as somebody who has seen epilepsy up close and personal, uh, there are several unique nuances to this talk. You will hear about epilepsy from a very clinical perspective from me and Cindy will bring a different flavor to the talk as well. So with that being said, Cindy will advance the slides for me. We'll just jump into the talk. Um, go ahead, Cindy, next slide. Okay. So um, I have no conflict of interest, but the work that I do is currently supported by uh, grants from um, HRSA through the Michigan Department of Community Health and the AAP, as I just mentioned. 
Today we're going to have a 90-minute webinar uh, for you medical practitioners and case managers out there. Things we'll be covering is epilepsy and the definition of seizures, diagnosis and treatment, seizure definition, first aid, everybody needs to know about that, some safety features, uh, epilepsy and medication management, advanced care and treatments Dr. Doshi, Joshi will talk about and uh, what an epileptologist is, an epilepsy center, the different levels of SUDEP, what SUDEP is, which is sudden unexpected due to epilepsy. Cindy? Uh, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but um, we you broke up and so we couldn't hear what you just said. Oh, okay. Um, well, this is just a review of what the seminar is going to be. Uh, and it's a 90 minute uh, webinar here. And we're gonna cover a lot of topics uh, from the basics of epilepsy, the definition, the diagnosis, how it's diagnosed and treat, treated. And, and a lot of that, we've made so many advances in the last years with epilepsy. Um, we're going through seizure definition, first aid, safety, epilepsy and medications. We're gonna talk about advanced care and treatments and as Dr. Joshi said, uh, about an epileptologist, which is what she is, a pediatric epileptologist, what that is what advanced care means in the different levels of epilepsy center, what sudden unexpected death due to epilepsy is, which is SUDEP. Uh, myself, I'm gonna talk about client and child advocacy because some of you guys are in the case management role. Uh, schools, how to accommodate kids in schools. Uh, and we'll talk about the telemedicine project, bringing advanced care to the rural areas where in some places we don't, we ha don't even have a neurologist. So uh, we're very lucky that the state of Michigan is supporting, supporting the telemedicine. We'll have a question and answer period, and of course, always an evaluation. All right, thank you, Cindy. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always good to start with what are we really talking about? And let's first just discuss what a seizure is. A seizure is defined as a sudden stereotyped episode with change in motor activity, sensation, behavior, and or consciousness. And a seizure can involve changes in all these, some of these, or one of these in varying combinations, sequentially, not sequentially. But the bottom line is all these changes occur due to an abnormal electrical discharge in the brain, which is traditionally measured by an electroencephalogram. Now, just very, very broadly, we think of seizures as provoked seizures. So here, this would include a seizure with a clear acute antecedent cause. In children, the most common cause is fever, what we call a febrile seizure, or somebody can have a, an acute provoked seizure from an infection like meningitis or encephalitis, acute head trauma, or metabolic abnormalities. The common ones are hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, hyponatremia. When we talk about unprovoked seizures, these are seizures that occur without a clear factor. And we'll get into this a little bit more. Now, epilepsy is the condition of recurrent unprovoked seizure. Um, the term seizure disorder is often used interchangeably for epilepsy. Epilepsy still, the word itself carries a lot of stigma in clinical practice and with families, but it, all that it is, it is the condition of recurrent unprovoked seizures. It can be from an old head trauma, which causes scarring and leads to recurrent unprovoked seizures. It can be from a, an infection like herpes encephalitis in a baby, which causes, again, damage to the brain, injury to the brain, and leads to seizures down the road. It can be from an underlying genetic predisposition, as we are learning more and more in several of the pediatric epilepsies in particular. Now, you know, people think of epilepsy as an exotic, esoteric disease, but really it is quite common. In a very elegantly done epidemiology study by Sharon Russ and her colleagues, which was published in Pediatrics, um, about 1% of children have epilepsy, which is a pretty large number when you think of the U.S. population and how many children uh, we have. Um, I just want to uh, take a few seconds to say that throughout the handout, throughout the slides, 
you will see references to uh, scientific papers. And for those of you who are interested, I would highly recommend uh, looking at some of those publications to read. Some of them look like they are a little old, but they really are seminal quality papers that have defined the, what we do in epilepsy today. When you look at sort of epilepsy across the lifespan, adults, children, really one in 26 individuals at some point in their life will have had a diagnosis of epilepsy. Again, that just underscores the point that epilepsy is very common and affects a lot of individuals. And so, um, you know, the kind of care and diagnosis that we provide becomes all the more important. In fact, it is like the fourth most common neurological disorder. Uh, next slide, please, Cindy. Now, I look at the two terms, seizures and epilepsy, as seizures are kind of the building blocks that make epilepsy. So first, let's talk about what kind of seizures are we likely to encounter in clinical practice. The typical description of seizures includes generalized seizures, where the seizure starts in both hemispheres of the brain together, or you cannot define a single focal point where the seizure starts. We also have focal seizures where there is a focus or a more defined localized area in the brain where the seizure starts. These previously used to be called partial seizures, but the term partial has now been, um, has been replaced by focal. When you have a focal seizure where awareness is retained, the former terminology was simple partial seizures. When you have a focal seizures where there is some alteration of cognition, what we call discognitive features, that seizure used to be called complex partial seizure. And a seizure is a wave of electricity that travels in the brain. So it can start in one area and spread what we call a secondarily generalized seizure. In children in particular, some seizures fall kind of in a gray area, so it's hard to know whether they are truly focal or truly generalized. So to make everybody's life simple, we call them unclassified. Next slide, please. So here is an example of a video that I'm gonna have Cindy play. Um, I can talk you through the video or I would say just look at it yourself. It's a little boy sitting up, doing homework. He's being really good. I wish my kids did that. <laughs> There he goes. Okay, pause, kind of blank look on his face, a little eyelid fluttering, notice that he's doing some lip smacking movements, bringing his hands up, and he's done. He's back, he's doing homework, but he clearly doesn't know that something interrupted him. Here's another one. Oh, okay. Oh, hold on. All right, I'll go back. back. Okay, so this is an example of a generalized from onset seizure. If you ran an EG during that kid's symptoms, you're going to see a very characteristic pattern on the EG. This is what we call absence seizures. It's a French term um, where you know, there is this loss of time, this loss of behavior, this behavior arrest, and these are called absence seizures. Okay, Cindy, next one, please. This one, watch the whole video because it changes as the video goes along. You're not sure what that kid did there. Did the kid just look down and nod at somebody that somebody said to, you know, here's another one. Looks fine in between, a third one, smiling. There's this very dramatic loss of body tone where the child goes forward, head goes down, and it looks like if this child was standing, it would probably fall. Another one, larger amplitude. These are excellent examples of what we call atonic seizures, seizures with loss of tone. And they, these tend to occur in clusters like you just saw and can go on for several minutes, discrete seizures happening back to back. Okay, now brace yourselves. This can, this is, this, these videos tend to be a little graphic, but this is, oh, wait, what happened there? Well, I'm trying to get the, 
No, for some reason it's not, it didn't download. Huh. Hmm. Do you want to go to the next one? Let's see what this one is. Okay. So pay it, pay it. Oh, this one didn't download either. Huh. It okay. didn't download. That's huh. all right. Keep going, Cindy. It's all right. We, we, we can see if we can come back to these later. Uh, you know what? Hold on. Oh, got it. Okay. All right. So this is a young man sitting in an epilepsy monitoring unit. You can see that he has EEG leads on his head. He's clearly engaged in doing something. So it looks like he stops what he's doing. His head goes off to the right with the right arm flailing, if you will. His body is going to get stiff. There's a loud vocalization, and you'll see this rhythmic jerking of all four extremities. And that horse cried at the beginning. So they're getting some oxygen around him just to make sure that he, when he does, that if he's not moving air, he'll not get too hypoxic. When it's slowing down, you can see the frequency is getting less. Sometimes the amplitudes of the jokes can get a little larger as the seizure slows down. This is a great example of a convulsive seizure. And nobody, not even the epileptologists, like to see these happen. Okay. You want to go to the next one? Okay. Cindy, if you want, you can talk them through this one because you know these videos really well. <laughs> I, she's got me muted, I think. No, I don't. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Well, these, this is a, a myoclonic seizure. You'll watch the, the shoulders all of a sudden. And a, a syndrome called juvenile myoclonic, it frequently happens in the morning. But very brief, brief, quick. You got to really be watching these. There you go. Right there. See if she does it again. She can talk through these. So, I mean, seizures do not necessarily mean unconsciousness. Okay. Then, okay. So let's get um, out of that. Uh, there we go. Okay. And let's go to the next slide. Now, these, this is a simple partial motor seizure, but as Dr. Joshi said, the classifications are changing. So and we have a few slides talking about the classifications coming up, but right. it's essentially a focal seizure with mainly motor manifestations. Manifestations. I think another thing that that struck me when I first saw these videos when Cindy shared them with me is you see children, you see young adults. My guess is the gentleman who had the big convulsive seizure was sort of an older adolescent or a young adult. And you, know, and you see kids from of, of varying backgrounds. So epilepsy really transcends all boundaries of age, of race, of geography. Um, and again, actually this is a video from somewhere in India. I can tell from the language that's being spoken in the video, but go ahead and play it. And it's an excellent example of a focal okay. motor. Seizure. Yes. As I can get <laughs> for some reason, my mouse is not. Okay. Come on. There it is. There we go. Look at that mouth. Only the mouth. And this kid is awake. This kid will get up and walk around if you tell the kid to walk around. A lot of these go unrecognized, um, especially some of the ones that have psychic manifestations in children. 
पहले भी कभी हुआ है क्या इसको पहली बार हुआ है घर में किसी और को तो नहीं होता so the doctor is asking them whether this is the first time it's happened whether anybody else in the family has this okay let's go to the next one so this is a long one but i think the beginning is what you really want to see and this is your typical example of what we call complex partial seizures or focal discognitive seizures and just watch this young man's behavior mm. there we go wait ain't uncle bro looking around kind of wait ain't typical wait ain't uncle bro automatism And you can be confused okay. at this time, slipping in and That's out, but typically on. you have large periods of confusion. Now he's... Got any idea what's going on, Uncle Grum? There he goes. He can no, understand no her, can't communicate at that time. But he's coming out of it. Now it's happening. Now we have some commands. There he focuses on it. But he can't still respond. Do you know what you're so. doing two seconds ago? No. All right. That was a good show of, of different stages of seizure of a seizure. That's there. true. Now having looked at this um you know this menu of seizures if you will and these were some excellent examples of the different kinds of seizures it is important to recognize that not all paroxysmal events are seizures not all not everything that shakes is a seizure and in the evaluation and differential diagnosis it is extremely important to remember that there are imitators of seizures now since we're talking about children and youth with epilepsy there are several physiological processes that mimic seizures so something that looks like a seizure and that is not a seizure is not automatically a psychiatrically based symptom um uh, as an epileptologist i do spend a considerable amount of time sorting through what is seizures and what is not seizures and that is important also so some of the common non epileptic events include uh stiffening that can look like a seizure with a very prominent tonic phase from gastroesophageal reflux breath holding spells are common in young children night terrors you know where kids have no idea what they're doing their eyes are wide open they're screaming they're unresponsive they can shake and flail around and it can look like a seizure other sleep disorders in young children benign neonatal myoclonus so the kind of myoclonic jerking that uh, Cindy showed you in the young woman can appear in neonates and it's a completely normal benign process now people who pass out or experience what is called syncope can have a few convulsive jerks at the end of their syncopal episode it's just a provoked little seizure like symptom but we don't consider it epilepsy and then there is an entire sort of pandora's box of psychiatrically based episodes panic attacks anxiety episodes conversion disorder that can all mimic seizures it is useful to keep a differential in mind particularly when you're evaluating somebody with paroxysmal events that don't really sound like seizures and are not behaving like seizures and are not responding to lots and lots of anti seizure medicines next slide please now as we talked about different types of seizures we also need to just quickly go over the classification of epilepsies i bring this up because this has been a monumental work for the epilepsy community and it really impacts a lot of things like icd9 icd10 uh, coding and diagnosis um, so why do we classify from a clinical perspective it is important to frame uh, to frame your diagnosis a classifying an epilepsy can lead a clinician and you know like i said it has ramifications everywhere to define an appropriate workup a certain type of epilepsy might not need an mri scan it's a big deal in a child who needs to be sedated for an mri scan and if you don't need neuroimaging in that first absence epilepsy that we saw we are, we avoid a we avoid a procedure with potential morbidity appropriate treatments can be selected based on the type of epilepsy therefore classification is important 
And there are certain non-pharmacologic treatments such as the ketogenic diet that may be appropriate in a certain type of epilepsy, but you won't know that somebody has it if you can't classify it. And of course, there's a better understanding of prognosis based on what type of epilepsy someone has. Next slide, please. So very quickly, the classification that was very popular uh, as defined by the International League Against Epilepsy in 1989, classified epilepsies into what we call focal or localization related epilepsies, the generalized epilepsies, and then epilepsies where you couldn't tell where they came from. The etiology of epilepsies was very, very broadly classified into idiopathic, meaning we don't know, symptomatic, meaning there is some underlying symptomatic process, and a third category called cryptogenic, where you know, you kind of sort of know that there is something going on, but you just haven't found it. Now, we've moved away from this classification to a newer organization of epilepsy in 2010. And this was really fueled by advances in neuroscience that have improved the understanding and etiology of epilepsies, particularly in the field of genetics where tests like chromosomal microarray analysis, epilepsy gene panels, and whole exome sequencing have completely changed what we know and don't know about many of the epilepsies, not all, but many. Uh, better neuroimaging studies with epilepsy protocol MRI scans, three Tesla MRI scans, can now uh, pick up small areas of focal cortical dysplasia. And our advances in immunology have also better defined many of the autoimmune epilepsies that were unclassified before, probably in the cryptogenic process. So what has happened in this new system is gone are the terms that we just talked about, simple partial, complex partial, secondarily generalized. And these are replaced by slightly more clunky terms where we describe whether there is or isn't impairment of consciousness or use the term discognitive, which means impaired consciousness. And then if it's a discognitive seizure, but it secondarily generalizes, we simply say evolving to a convulsive seizure. Next slide, please. So this is the citation, which is, a, again, it's a little heavy to read, but it's worth it because it's written by a very impressive who's who in the world of epilepsy. And really a lot of thought has gone into reorganizing how we discuss epilepsies. Next slide, please. So the other thing that comes up in the new classification is what we call epilepsy syndromes. And just like a genetic syndrome, so take Down syndrome, for example, it's got, you have a complex of clinical features, you have recognizable sign and symptoms, you have an underlying etiology, but before the genetic etiology was described over there, it simply was a child with a certain facial phenotype, a certain body type with the low muscle tone, the, the, you know, the uh, microcephaly, the uh, intellectual disability and developmental problems, we call that Down syndrome. And when you put all these clinical features, signs and symptoms together, you have a distinctive recognizable clinical disorder. So in the same way we now emphasize electroclinical syndromes in epilepsy. Next slide, please. So my apologies that this is a very tiny font, which I don't have my glasses, so I can barely read. Um, but again, this is a table from the same publication by Dr. Berg and colleagues that, that looks at electroclinical syndromes broken down by age. So here you have a child presenting in a certain age group with a certain type of epilepsy, and then you have the various syndromes. It immediately gets you thinking along a certain line of diagnostic modalities and certain lines of treatment. Next slide, please. So let's move on from, we've decided this is a seizure. We've, you know, we've understood how the classification works. Now we're to, down to kind of, this is the real deal. This is a kid who shows up either in an ER or in a primary care physician's office, or you get a call from a parent saying this child had some kind of paroxysmal event. So the first step is, was this really a seizure? I cannot tell you how important it is to get a detailed description of the event. In fact, in today's day and age, if these are habitual events that are occurring, there is nothing more handy than a cell phone that a parents can actually um, videotape an event and bring it in for, um, for someone to look at. The patient's past medical history is extremely important. Was the vape child born prematurely? Was there um, a CNS infection? Determine truly if it was a first seizure. 
Cindy will probably attest to this. I bet you in the child with absence seizures, the first seizure that was called the first seizure was probably not the first seizure. It was only when learning that somebody noticed it. And then, of course, was it a non-epileptic paroxysmal event? And these can be difficult to sort out in like your first class acute evaluation. Next slide, please. Now, when you're doing your first class acute evaluation, you do want to try and figure out what's the cause of this event. We'll, we'll assume that this was a seizure. Was it head trauma, CNS infection? We talked about metabolic abnormalities. In children, toxic ingestions are very, very important. Or is this the first manifestation of underlying epilepsy? Next slide, please. So we tend to get routine labs, but the yield is low in the absence of clinical symptoms. Again, if you're not sure, they are low cost tests that are not associated with too many complications. So the common tests to get would be a serum glucose, electrolytes, and alcohol level, particularly in adolescents, and where appropriate a toxicology drug screen. You know, if it's a younger child who may have got into something or an adolescent who is using recreational drugs or other substances, you would consider that. Another question that often comes up is, should everybody who presents with a first-time seizure get a spinal tap? Um, a very well-written practice parameter from the American Academy of Neurology uh, suggests that a lumbar puncture is not recommended following a single unprovoked seizure. You should consider it if there are other signs that, that point towards a CNS infection. If it's a young child less than six months, again, the key word here is considered. It's not an automatic do it. If there is persistent altered mental status or the child fails to return to baseline, those are times when you at least consider maybe an LP is necessary. Uh, next slide, please. The other cornerstone test in working up a seizure is an EEG. Usually it's okay to do it as an outpatient and that's how you know the practical uh, nature is that EEG is not available 24 seven everywhere. Ideally, if you do it within 24 to 48 hours, you're more likely to pick up an abnormality. But some abnormalities can simply be a result of the seizure and they should be interpreted cautiously. Next slide, please. Now, the, the problem with EEGs is they are abnormal only 70% of the time. And they can be, so it's not, a normal EEG does not exclude that an event was a seizure. An abnormal EEG doesn't automatically mean something was a seizure. You can, uh, you do, you have to put it in clinical context, um, and they can be useful in diagnosing something as a seizure versus a non-seizure. If you have, for example, somebody who had a very prolonged state of altered consciousness and has a completely normal EEG, you're going to wonder whether this was a seizure or something else. Next slide, please. Uh, you can. Um, Okay, so what is the kind of stuff we look for on an EEG? Is there focal slowing? Are there, is there a type of discharge called spikes, which are more predictive of a recurrence of a seizure? And that's really what an EEG is trying to do. It's trying to tell somebody how likely is your child going to have a second seizure. Next slide, please. When you, EEGs, to us neurologists, epileptologists, they're very useful in looking at that epilepsy syndrome that we talked about, because that has an, an implication on long-term outcomes. Next. Now we come to neuroimaging. So I'll just point this slide out to you. This is a coronal section of an MRI. Uh, it's a T2 weighted image where the CSF looks bright white and where Cindy's little, oh, Cindy, put the cursor back. That was perfect. Yeah. Where Cindy's little cursor was, that is not spinal, that's not CSF, but that is a sclerosed mesial temporal lobe. This is the classic picture that we see in temporal lobe epilepsy. So, you know, again, what do you do with your first time seizure kid? Should you image them with a head CT? Um, if the history is right, if the story is right, yes. But the incidence of lesions requiring acute intervention is extremely low in children. It's just about 2%. On the other hand, the most common MRI abnormalities that you are going to see in children are something called, is, is basically an abnormality of cerebral development called cerebral dysgenesis or an, um, a, a scarred area with encephalomalacia, which usually indicates an old perinatal or in utero brain injury. MRIs are much, much better at picking up these kind of abnormalities. 
And therefore, if there is a non-urgent imaging study to be done, an MRI is much better. Besides, an MRI is no radiation and a head CT, even though small amount of radiation, is radiation to a child's brain. Next slide, please. Okay, here is the bigger question. What do you do? Do you put a child on anti-seizure medicines? Do you treat or not treat? So it's almost a little Shakespearean to treat or not treat. That is the question. <laughs> um, by and large, after a first unprovoked afebrile seizure, we don't start kids on an anti-seizure medication. And this is why we don't do it. The risk of seizure recurrence after a first unprovoked afebrile seizure is about 53% in six months. And most of them, if they recur, are gonna recur within a couple of years. So if you sort of spin this around, it means only half your kids are gonna have a second seizure, which is going to be your population that you will say has epilepsy and need recurrent treatment. But you could end up treating half the kids who don't need another, who just have a seizure for whatever reason and don't have another seizure again. So there are many children who will have just one seizure. In fact, one of my mentors when I was in training used to say everybody is allowed one seizure. And um, there are implications of anti-seizure medications um, in terms of side effects, in terms of monitoring. Definitely parents have concern. And most children are in safe, supervised settings. And Cindy will talk about seizure safety, first aid, precautions. As long as we do a good job educating our families, we don't need to put every kid with a first unprovoked afebrile seizure on medications. Next slide. So what we often will do is try to assess who is at risk for seizure recurrence. So the risk factors for seizure recurrence are if there is some remote symptomatic etiology, the child had a perinatal stroke. There was a herpes infection. Um, there is, was head trauma with clearly a subdural bleed, and you can see an area of encephalo. You know that the child had a skull fracture with an injured brain. The EEG is, shows clear abnormality. Seizures occurring in sleep are, sl are a slightly more risk factor for seizure recurrence. Prior febrile seizures can be a risk factor in certain epilepsies, such as temporal lobe epilepsy, and a seizure that leads to a post-ictal hemiparesis also is a risk factor for recurrence. The more number of risk factors you have in your story, the higher the rate of seizure recurrence. Now, again, late recurrences depends on the etiology, what type of EG abnormality and febrile seizures are predictive of seizures occurring later on. Let me digress for a second over here. I do not want to send off alarm bells in every primary care practitioner's mind that every child with a febrile seizure is at risk for developing epilepsy. That is totally not the case. In fact, children with febrile seizures have only a slightly risk for developing um, epilepsy later on. And even though we use febrile seizures in our assessment for seizure recurrence, it is only after you have had that unprovoked afebrile seizure do we go back and say, oh, did you have febrile seizures? But going forward, it is not that every child with febrile seizures is at risk for epilepsy. So I just want to make that clear because sometimes those nuances can get lost in how the data are presented. Next slide, please. Um, so as we talk about treatment, the question comes up, how do you find the ideal medicine? Well, we all want everything. We want a medicine to be effective, of course. We want it to be safe. We want it to have few side effects. It needs to be easily absorbed so that your pharmacokinetics are good. We want, ideally, to have it be given in a single daily dose to ensure compliance. It should not interact with anything else. And above all, it should be inexpensive. I can tell you there is a reason there is that no sign next to it an ideal medicine like this does not exist. We've done immensely well in strides in pharmacology, but an ideal medicine with this profile does not exist. Next slide. So our job is to make the pieces fit, address the type of epilepsy, how old a child is, what are we dealing with with regards to medication pharmacology, what other coexisting conditions does a child have, and make these pieces fit and make 
uh, make a make a, a choice of medications. Next slide. So the other question comes up, do you use one drug? Do you use more drugs? Is it better to use polytherapy because you have different mechanism of actions? But even today, the most effective treatment is with a single drug chosen on the basis of what type of epilepsy, what type of seizures, and titrated to seizure control or side effects. We don't like polypharmacy or polytherapy because of side effects that you can get. The more number of drugs, the more likely you're going to get side effects. And there are drug-drug interactions. Um, again, it is definitely an area of debate, discussion, and reflection whether drugs with different mechanisms of action um, afford what we call rational polytherapy or synergism. This has been exploited extremely well in the cancer pharmacology area, but I don't think we're there yet for epilepsy. Next slide. So as I said, the choice of anti-seizure medicines is based on seizure type, epilepsy syndrome. Things like age get taken into account. Valproate is not the preferred drug for children under two years. And even with all the strides we've made in medicine, phenobarbital still remains our drug of choice in neonatal seizures. Amazing as that sounds, that is the case today. We take coexisting conditions such as weight, feeding into account. For instance, drugs like topiramate that suppress appetite would not be the best in an, in an adolescent or in a child with low weight. Uh, valproate, clobazam can be associated with weight gain. And so again, you have to take that into account. Uh, medical conditions such as somebody with, pre with um, a sulfa allergy might not be the best candidate for uh, zonisamide since that's a sulfonamide. So these are sort of the things that go into the decision-making analysis when you take into account what seizure medicines should be used. Um, of course, like I said, this is just the same thing recapped in a different way. Um, how quickly can you titrate a medication? Medications such as Lamotrigine take forever to titrate. So if a child is having, you know, 10, 20 seizures a day, you don't have the luxury of 12 weeks to titrate Lamotrigine, for example. And then, of course, as I said, efficacy and safety have to be the cornerstone. So as we do this, this is just a graphic way of saying this is what you want, the perfect balance between efficacy and safety. And I would say we do okay, but maybe not. Next slide, please. For the generalized epilepsies, so in what you saw in those videos, the child with the absent seizures or atonic seizures or the convulsive seizures, we would pick medicines that have a broader spectrum, such as deptosuximide, valproate, lamotrigine, topiramate, zonisamide, or levetiracinam. The, the important thing to remember here is carbamazepine or more recently oxcarbazepine are not preferred, especially in absence epilepsies as you can provoke status epilepticus with like what we call absence status epilepticus. Next slide. There are certain specific pediatric epilepsy syndromes. One of them is called Rolandic epilepsy, where again, if you know your epilepsy syndrome diagnosis, you will pick either carbamazepine or oxcarbazepine. Uh, in absence epilepsy, if you know it's absence epilepsy, these are the drugs you will pick, ethosuximide, valproate, or lamotrigine. Cindy mentioned juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. Levetiracetam has become the preferred drug, but the cornerstone historically was valproic acid or valproate. And in the more catastrophic epilepsies like lennox gastaut syndrome, there are a lot of broad spectrum medicines that are used, some of which are listed on this slide. Okay. So this was sort of your Epilepsy Pharmacology 101. I'm going to send this back to Cindy to talk about the more sort of practical, hands-on issues about managing medications. Okay, thank you, Dr. Joshi. I, I don't have the wisdom that Dr. Joshi has, and uh, so mine is a little bit toned down. Um, what's involved in managing medications for epilepsy? Definitely. Um, educating the parent on the type of medication they're using, the side effects, <clears throat> so they know what to look out for. I mean, there, there's side effects that are common to a lot of the epilepsy medications, such as drowsiness, unsteadiness, dizziness, um, sometimes vision problems, um, memory, especially short-term memory, um, coordination and thinking. Um, but then there's, there's ones that are, are more life-threatening that they really should be alerted to, too. Um, Dr. Joshi talked about lamotrigine and um, 
titrating that very slowly. The reason it's titrated very slowly is rashes, life-threatening rashes are very common, uh, something called Steven Johnson syndrome. And definitely a child will have to be taken off of that with a life-threatening uh, side effect such as that. Uh, there can be salt depletion. And, and with salt depletion, what, what can happen with salt depletion but seizures? So what's causing it? The medication or the salt depletion? Uh, Thalbamate. You can have uh, aplastic anemia with that, which can be life-threatening. And then there's the toxic side effects that uh, have to deal with um, how the body's reacting to the medication. I mean, a lot of these medications can lower the hemoglobin, lower the white blood count, um, platelet count. Uh, therefore, we're looking for, you know, signs of bleeding, um, pinpoint signs of bleeding, early signs that might mean the, that their body cannot handle this. And of course, there's levels to be taken on some of these medications, but it's debatable from the medical community, correct, Dr. Joshi, as far as what is a therapeutic level and what is a toxic level for someone. I mean, we have parameters, but still, that can be very individualized. Uh, looking at, so all of those things you have to talk to the parent about and teach the parent. Uh, compliance. Compliance can be a big problem. Myself, um, I always tell people it's not easy being on epilepsy medication. As Dr. Joshi said, um, you know, med no medication is perfect. Um, parents or anyone who started on an epilepsy medication, they expect life to be like it was before without being on any type of medication. So they're looking for medication with no side effects. And um, sometimes people go medication shopping to medication shopping because they're not giving a realistic expectation of what they should expect out of medication. Um, I always say it's, it's, the goal was no seizures, no side effects. No seizures is a good goal. No side effects I do not think is realistic. But, and that's when we have problems with compliance. A lot of problems with compliance when people can't tolerate the side effects. Or another reason for compliance is they don't understand the chronicity of epilepsy and the need for continued treatment, um, especially parents. When I worked as a school nurse, I had one parent that took their child off their epilepsy medication because hmm, they thought they were cured. They were no longer having seizures. And um, sure enough, uh, the child definitely needed to be on seizure medication, started having seizures again. So anything that can help uh, to them get the correct around amount of medication. Automatic refills are out there. Uh, some of the, phar I know my pharmacy sends me, it refills mine automatically and sends me a note and says, hey, We've refilled it. They will even call the doctor and say, hey, we're having a problem. We will call the doctor. You need to get in touch with them for an appointment. Um, medication alarms. I always use my uh, cell phone for a medication alarm. Uh, pill boxes, setting up pill boxes, because as we know, memory problems are big, can be a problem. Did I take my medication? Did I not take my medication? And when you have a parent who has epilepsy and a child who has epilepsy, that can really truly be a problem. It's a double check system. Simplified regimes, okay? Uh, we don't like to see people on three times a day, four times a day medications. Sometimes that's necessary, but when you get the, the extended release medications, which uh, need to be taken maybe once or twice a day, that's, that's a lot easier for them. Um, missed medication instructions. Parents are very, very afraid of giving their child an extra medication. So that's something about the what ifs. What if the child throws up, okay, two hours after he's taking his medication? What if, will it hurt the child if I have to give it an extra medication? All these types of things. So they need to know what the maximum dose for their weight is and things like that when I talk to them so they can ease their concerns. Um, they need to track definitely when their medications are taken. And seizure tracking is important because that's going to tell you whether the medication is the right medication for them, whether it's effective for them, whether they're going to have side effects, etc. Some good tools uh, online is something called seizuretracker.com. Then when we're dealing with the transition to, from childhood to adult, uh, from childhood to teens, the earlier you get a child involved in their self-care, the better off it is. Uh, sometimes we have some very overprotective parents who are afraid to let go. I know to this day and age, my husband still asks me if I take my epilepsy medication every day, okay? And I think it's more a caregiver fear, of, I don't want to see you have a seizure in front of me. And parents feel the same way. Um, but um, so the more trust you get in that child and showing them the necessity, lead by example, have that parent lead by example with, with a 
med alarms, uh, with pill boxes, with a calendar of when everything is due, and start letting the child ease into that transition, setting up their own med box, uh, keeping track when their appointments are and those things. And that will only uh, make it easier for the parent to let go of the child and have some, some locus of control for themselves of their own disorder. Uh, this is talking about the epilepsy medications and side effects. We have this um, at online at our foundation website. So if you need the information, just give us a call and uh, I can show you where to get it. It's a great chart. It shows the side effects, common side effects, what they're used for, because uh, Dr. Joshi talk, will talk about the different uses for different epilepsy medications and the doses, adult and child. Back to you, Dr. Joshi. Sorry, I had muted my microphone for a second there. Um, so, so far we've talked about treatment of epilepsy in the framework of the various medications we have, some principles of how medications are chosen to, uh, based on the type of epilepsy and comorbid medical conditions. However, treatment of seizures is just one aspect or really the tip of the iceberg when it comes to management of epilepsy. Management of epilepsy is a much, much bigger picture. Um, these, uh, this little pie diagram that you see here is not to scale, it's not really proportionate, but management of epilepsy involves treatment of seizures, it involves education and learning, which is huge in our children and youth. There are several safety issues, including driving, which we will touch upon today. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, about bone and reproductive health. And I think this is probably one area where the specialist, be it a neurologist or an epileptologist, and a primary care practitioner can form a perfect alliance in the management of epilepsy. Um, where did my picture go? Oh, wait. Okay. Okay, can you go back a slide, please? Um, we'll talk a little bit about family issues because as you see, epilepsy really is a disorder that affects the entire family. So to recap what I just said, next slide, please. What we're talking about is a complex, dis complex disorder where recurrent unprovoked seizures are one symptom, but you really have mental health, learning, behavior, and other physical health comorbidities that influence the comprehensive management. Next slide. Back to you, Cindy, I believe. Okay. Yes. Um, back to epilepsy management a little bit. Uh, again, um, Dr. Joshi gave a great uh, lecture just now about uh, epilepsy and the causes for the, for the practitioner, but when we're teaching non-licensed uh, non and we're teaching schools, when we're teaching people with no medical knowledge at all, we have to really simplify it. Um, but it's still necessary information they need to know. They need to know the type of the epilepsy they have. Um, they need to know any causative factor, though, be it majority, um, and there's statistics varying on it, 70% they can't find a cause. And that's a very frustrating fact for parents, but what I always say for parents is a lot of times it doesn't matter the cause. The thing is you have it, you have to treat it. Um, seizure types, they have to know specifically the seizure types. So when they're communicating to other people, um, that person has a, a great, it's good to have a, a universal language when we talk about these things. So when a person goes from one community to another via a hospital, via a school, uh, that we're all using the same language when we're talking about the uh, seizure types. I've had parents tell me, my child has uh, very uh, small seizures. Uh, what do you mean by small seizures? And it turned out the child has absence. And when I explained to them what the brainwaves are doing in the old term generalization, they, they don't really realize it. And um, sometimes they don't take that serious. Um, auras, uh, whether someone has an aura. A lot of people don't recognize their auras, especially in children. Children can't communicate when they're feeling different prior to a seizure. So uh, explain to a parent what an aura is or where a prodromal symptom is. They can look and monitor for those things and hopefully have some predictability in seizure occurrence. Um, a lot of times those auras go mi missed until someone finally uh, generalizes. And that occurred to myself, even with my father having epilepsy. I went through high school having um, auras, and I was having um, simple partial, actually. I was having uh, deja vu 
which is very typical for temporal lobe. I just thought it was psychic all the time. Um, they need to know their meds. Again, we talked about different choices. They need to have, know what meds treat uh, their types of epilepsy and have the choices and what the doctor prefers. Um, having different choices, of course, gives a person better compliance. Uh, the different treatments, if medications aren't working, okay? A lot of people talk now about um, the carbidoils, uh, adjunctive treatment. Um, they talk about a VNS, uh, people with refractory epilepsy having a vagus nerve stimulator put in children. Um, so there's other treatments other than medication, though medication is number one. And um, they require tests and follow-ups. They need to know how often those are occurring so they know when they're having good care, when they're not having good care. Um, seizure tracking, we went through that basically. Um, symptoms, the duration, how long they last. I had a child that was having uh, seizures daily, um, and his seizures would last seven minutes, and I was called in to advocate in the school. Well, they were giving him a rescue med called Diostat daily. People, that is not to be used daily. And when we looked at his duration, it was seven minutes. We changed the plan to greater than seven minutes. They haven't given him Diostat in two years. So it's important for them to know that. And recovery, when is that child expected to be back functioning normal, okay? Don't prolong the recovery. We don't want the sick role maintained, especially when we're in schools. Um, but there is a period of recovery, and we need to know what it is for that child. Patterns, time of day or month, uh, very important for teens or women. Um, uh, keeping track of their ovulation and their menses, because uh, definitely there is some hormonal influence in some types of what we call catamenial epilepsies. Recurring triggers. Uh, a lot of par parents are afraid of flashing lights and strobe lights because they hear that common uh, warning that that triggers all forms of epilepsy. Well, that only happens in three and four percent. So you have to look at recurring triggers so we avoid uh, overprotectiveness. A trigger is something that is not the cause of their epilepsy, but it can lower their seizure threshold and cause a person to have epilepsy to have a seizure. Uh, behavior changes, especially in those children that are cognit cognitively impaired. Uh, behavior changes may be mistaken for behavioral problems when actually they could be auras, they could be prodromal symptoms, they could be seizure activity itself. Uh, the handout, the next handout I have for you, and I can't go through it, but this is basically an epilepsy 101 of what we give parents so that when they go to the doctor's office, they know what questions to ask. Simple questions are uh, about the seizures, what happened before the seizure, what happened after the seizure, any other symptoms you've had, or any treatment changes that are to occur. So um, that is also on our website. Recurrent seizures and safety. Medic alert bracelets. No one likes to wear a medic alert bracelet, especially when you're dealing with a child or a teen. But there are some very nice ones. Uh, have the child pick theirs out. Uh, go online, look at, look at some of the jewelry oriented that are, are less military looking for some of the girls. Um, Knowing and teaching others first aid is vital, be it a caregiver, be it a school, be it a, a church, a Sunday school personnel, uh, be it someone that your child is spending the night with, uh, definitely, so they can avoid unnecessarily 911 calls and unnecessary stigmatization for the child and psychosocial trauma, because um, you know not everybody with epilepsy who has a seizure, of course, goes 911. A seizure plan. A seizure plan is, is a necessity, so it shows other people what to do. And I have an example of one after this. And you can put on there the use of what type of rescue med they want, when you want 911 called, when the parent wants to be called, when uh, um, to use the VNS uh, stimulation with a magnet. Uh, seizure monitors. We have all different types of monitors. Uh, I talked about seizuretracker.com, but um, we also have different kinds of watches now uh, that are used for hopefully monitoring seizures. Um, some of those are the Smart Watch and the Embrace Watch. The National Foundation had, had a giveaway for Embrace Watches. A lot of these watches aren't FDA approved for seizure monitoring, but it helps, okay, because if the child is sleeping at night, it will alert the parent or anybody who's wearing another watch or, or, or it can communicate to their phone when there is some abnormal movement. Seizure response dogs, and I say seizure response dogs because people have a lot of parents or any consumer has the idea that it is a seizure predicting dog. We do not advocate that at all. Um, however, my dog knows when I'm not feeling well in any case. Um, but 
one thing to know that uh, Paws with a Cause and Canine Companions are, are good, and it's good for psychosocial for a child, especially if they're having frequent seizures, missing school, missing that interaction too. Uh, activity limitations, and that's really dependent on the doctor, the type of seizures they have, and the parent also. I had one school that wanted to put a helmet on a child that, that had complex partial seizures. Well, helmets are, are used really for those with seizures that are unpredictable, like the drop seizures we saw at the beginning, the atonic seizures, because there's no predictor to that, and they can fall suddenly and have an injury to the head. Um, also, activity limitations can be eased off after we know how well the child is going to be controlled. Um, you know, there's things that I've done that, because I know my epilepsy, I've skydived, I've scuba dived, and things like that. Um, but I've known my epilepsy, I know how well controlled it is. Um, I'm not suggesting a child should do that, no. Um, but we have to look at overprotectiveness, let the child grow. We have a camp where these kids wall climb, they ride horses, they swim, all those types of activities. But of course, we always have safeguards intact. And then uh, home safety tips. Um, you know, bathing, what do we do? Uh, showers, uh, preferably. Uh, Handheld showers, grab bars, a speaker monitor, maybe in the bathroom when someone is taking a shower. Uh, when a, so those types of things. The doors are unlocked. Cooking safety, uh, that you have to go around the uh, stove. Slime, uh, swimming, climbing. Swimming with a buddy, I would say, you know, everybody should swim with a buddy, not just people with epilepsy. And, um, Anyone who's responsible, looking at sports and sports that are at a concussion risk. Uh, I know my son plays in a sport where he doesn't uh, wear a helmet, and, I'm a, and it's a high, um, high concussion impact. So all those types of things, and wearing protective gear when they are involved in those types of sports. Rescue medications. Um, I talked about a seizure plan and what rescue medications. Medi rescue medications are a very important safety factor, especially living out in the rural community or even in the city of Detroit where I've had response time being a half hour. You do not want a child going into prolonged seizures or cluster seizures, um, which I gave you the definitions there, are seizures greater than five minutes or two or more seizures without returning to a baseline orientation. Um, you don't want those children having that uh, without use of a rescue med because if 911 delay is delayed, they can go into established status epilepticus at a 30 to 60 minutes of seizing. And then, of course, the more dangerous is refractory status epilepticus, which is greater than 60 minutes. So rescue meds are created to prevent them from going into those uh, for the progression of status epilepticus, which is life-threatening. Looking at common... Uh, Rescue meds that are used in the community. Uh, we use the benzodiazepines usually, and they're fast acting, of course. And some of the common ones used, again, are diazepam, valium, clonopin, uh, lorazepam, ativan, um, midazolam, and some are used more frequently than others, depending on the physician's preference. So uh, the reason some of the different medications may be used are the types of seizures that are occurring and how fast of an onset that you want with this medication, the ability for the child to swallow, okay? Um, if they're having clusters of, of partial or complex partial seizures, complex partial may be a little bit more different difficult to give a PO med, but clusters of uh, partial seizures, um, auras, warnings, those types of things that may be used. Um, also, if the client has a preference, uh, some teens, uh, they don't want to have had teens that don't want to have diastat usage being known in the school. Uh, diastat is a rectal form of value that's used. Of course, availability and costs. Some places, the availability, especially midazolam, which is not FDA approved, not, uh, it's FDA approved used for sedation, but it's not FDA approved use for a rescue med. But Dr. Joshi uses it, a lot of epileptologists are using it because it's gonna be out for us pretty soon to be used. And that's Versed, um, and that can be given intranasally. So, you know, rather than rectal, intranasal. Great for kids in wheelchairs. Uh, also, I've had people order rectal diastat for complex partial seizures. Not too easy to give for a child with complex partial seizures, especially if they've had prolonged. Um, also, we have a lot of issues with the uh, non-licensed personnel in different areas in schools and their comfort. Um, but, 
you know, a lot of that is due to lack of education and a lack of familiarity with how to give the medication. And I do a lot of that education because I'm a nurse. I get called in. Um, prescribed forms. Valium, we can have PO, we can have unirectal, which I talked about, diastatic clonopin. Uh, is in an oral disintegrating tablets, great for clustering maybe of absence. Um, and it can be sublingual or buccal. Uh, Ativan again, PO, midazolam, uh, IN. If you want to look at Australia, they are giving it buccal and they've been using it. You can look at other countries and how progressive, especially Australia, in the use of midazolam. So here's a Cindy, I was, I was going to just back you up on your absolutely lovely overview of the rescue medications. Mm -hmm. uh, especially since we are often just like you at the forefront of having to um, order and deal with these rescue medications. If you just go back to your slide for just a minute, um, just as Cindy said, the most common form of a rescue medication that practitioners will write for, which has been tried, tested, and is exceedingly safe to use is the rectal diazepam, which is available as a proprietary formulation called diastat acudial. Now, the other medications are all extremely effective as well. So for example, lorazepam is used in oral intramuscular and intravenous form by paramedics, by ERs, by hospitals, by everybody. The, it is very well absorbed from the cheek. So you can actually, there is like a solution of lorazepam which can be given in the mouth. You have to be careful not to put it in the mouth of a convulsing child, but somebody who has clusters of seizures where in between a seizure, you can slip something in their mouth, it's great to use. Clonazepam, which comes as the disintegrating wafers can also be used for the same reason. I will, I will give intranasal midazolam a shout out just because of the route by which it can be administered and ha it has very rapid onset of action. And it's cleared out of the system faster too, Dr. Jones. Correct. It, has a, it, it is the shortest acting benzodiazepine, so it does not have lingering sedation. Unfortunately, just as Cindy said, it is not FDA approved for this particular route, for this particular use, which today produces some roadblocks in terms of getting it out there in the community. I would like to direct everybody in the audience to an excellent, excellent review of rescue medications for epilepsy in the school setting that was recently published in the journal Pediatrics. It was jointly written by the section on neurology for the AAP, as well as the Council on School Health to get their perspective also. Um, I did not have time to pull that reference and send it as a handout, but I'm quite happy to mail it to Cindy and Victoria for dissemination down the road. Uh, it's a really great reference. So, um, the, the, so basically, you know, the, if you look at the triangle of educators in epilepsy like Cindy, clinicians like us, and the family, it's sort of an alliance between the three to educate schools, to educate other providers for the type of midazolam that can be used. In my practice, for example, actually we have the parents come into the clinic for a 20-minute nurse visit for a small informal training session on how to put the midazolam in the nasal atomizer and give it to them. Parents are usually quite nervous about it before they come in and once they learn how to do it, it's really very easy. So, um, you know, we all hope that intranasal midazolam will become something that's more easily available and that can become more standard for a rescue medication. Cindy, back to you. I did not mean to take away. <laughs> that's quite all right. I was going to say, too, um, when we're dealing with schools, you have to look at our, our schools in Michigan uh, versus other states. I mean, we're last in the whole United States behind Puerto Rico in school nurse per student ratio. So we have a lot of non-licensed people giving it to a child that isn't theirs. And there has been some resistance on that form, but personally, I, my, as an advocate, I would say, listen, if you're giving an EpiPen, you're going to give this, okay? We're not asking you to be a nurse. This is a preliminary step uh, to hopefully stop seizures and uh, let the child recover. And um, I do that type of advocacy work, and I'll talk a little bit about 504 and an IEP later. This is a seizure plan. Any child, anybody in work or anything like that, um, it's a good example of one. And it will talk about basic the seizure types, length, length frequency, and description, uh, the basic first aid that's needed for that seizure type, um, and does the student uh, need to leave the classroom after the seizure? 
A lot of times they may not. Sometimes they do because of incontinence. Um, it's really dependent. But we want other children to realize that there's nothing wrong with seeing a seizure. Okay, that is a it is a fact of life, and the sooner they get to see that child recover and come back to class, the less stigmatizing it is. Um, looking at uh, when to contact a school nurse, we don't have any in Michigan hardly. So whoever, every school should have an emergency response team. So someone who should be designated and charged with those types of things. And those people have taken 911, not that, I mean, not have taken CPR courses, not that CPR is needed for uh, seizure first aid, but you at least have that. Um, when to call 911, when to notify the parent. A parent could be working and they have a child with refractory epilepsy that has frequent seizures during the day and they're calling them frequently to come take them home. Well, the child isn't sick. This is their normal existence. We have to know when a seizure is an emergency for that child, and this emergency response protocol will teach them that. It teaches what uh, seizure medication to give, uh, rescue medication to give, and when. Some doctors order it at three minutes, some doctors order it at five minutes. It can be tailored to that child and their length of seizure and when a seizure is considered an emergency for them. And then it has the VNS in there, because that could be part of it. You could stimulate the VNS first, twice, and then by five minutes, you're into a rescue med. We look at, uh, also, you have to have the physician's signature and the parent's signature uh, for schools, because the parent has to give consent. We have to have the doctor's orders for them to legally, the school to legally be able to give that and not be liable. So, managing seizures. A seizure tracker. Um, I already talked about that and talking about the describing the types and symptoms, looking for patterns. I did talk about that. Um, making note of possible triggers. We talked about that. And uh, paying attention to common seizure warnings for your child. Um, again, I get so many children reprimanded for behavioral issues, which are actually seizure activity or auras. It's hard for a child to say when they're not when they're having a seizure and how to describe things. So, um, teaching those school personnel or anyone, even parents, to realize could this be a side effect of the medication? Could this be seizure? Don't reprimand the child. Let's look at the causative factor. Um, speech difficulties can occur. Mood and behavioral changes can definitely occur with some of the side effects of medication, especially with the Keppra. Uh, and I don't want to bad mouth it, but um, you know, there's so many things that go into behavior and mood when someone is diagnosed with a chronic disorder, such as epilepsy. Um, let's go on. Seizure triggers, common seizure triggers. Missed medication is number one. Make sure that school understands their, if the child gets their medication when they need to get it. Medication compliance, we talked about that basically, making sure that the child is getting it, making sure the parent understands the need for compliance. Sleep deprivation, um, that's very common. Stress, how do you avoid stress? You can't avoid stress, it's how you deal with it. So some of these children need to uh, be in counseling, have an open door uh, policy for at the school with a social worker if you have one there. Alcohol, hopefully we're not dealing with that, or stimulants or illegal drugs in the teens, but it still can happen. Uh, fevers, infections, and illness, dehydration, hormonal changes, and flashing lights we talked about. Healthy sleep habits. How to develop a, a healthy sleep, a sleep habit. Children uh, usually need anywhere from 8.5 uh, to 12 hours of sleep a day. And it shows that the majority of, I mean, 15% of the teens don't get adequate sleep. And when you have epilepsy, that could be a big factor in having seizures or not having seizures. Also, there could be interictal discharges or what we call certain syndromes where you have a chronic uh, spike and wave syndrome at sleep that could be the child could look like they're asleep, but their sleep is disrupted because of these brainwave patterns. Um, anyways, Things that uh, lack of sleep, there's a lot of things lack of sleep can add to, which is mood changes. But when you have a child with epilepsy, there's another compounding factor. Tips to improve sleep, regular sleep schedule, uh, no caffeine, hopefully. Take the TV out of the bedroom, avoid any of those. Uh, if they can't sleep, you get up, walk, and then go back to sleep. Check for nocturnal seizures or medication side effects. Uh, I was on Lamictal, and one of the rare side effects was insomnia. Didn't realize it uh, because it kind of made me sedated during the day, but at night I couldn't sleep. And so I had to get off it, so it was a rare side effect. Um, get the child uh, tested for sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is very common if you're having sleep disturbances in epilepsy. So um, 
having a sleep study might be useful to find out what the true cause is because there can be many causes of lack of sleep. First aid, I don't think I need to, we're running short here, but talking about first aid, complex partial seizures where the person in that was doing what we call automatisms, which can be the hallmark of, of complex partial seizures, which is an automatic behavior that happens over and over and again that doesn't make sense. The one gentleman was lip smacking. He was also looking at his hands, turning it in and out. Realize these people are floating in and out in consciousness. And the worst thing that people do is they always tell someone, hey, come here, come here. Well, the person may not be able to understand or they may force them to sit down. Well, this person is confused. They're having feelings of paranoia and irritation. That could heighten their irritability. And a lot of times people who have these in public, sometimes that happens. Please get called. They try and uh, communicate to the person they can't, and the person ends up getting tasered or arrested. Hopefully that's not happening in schools, but um, we want to teach them proper first aid. And it's very hard for non-licensed to tell when someone is coming out of a complex partial seizure. So if we have a rescue med, when they're coming out in what we call the post-ictal period, that's not the time to give the rescue med. It's the ictal portion to give the rescue med. That causes overusage when we give the post during post ictal. So it's very important that they understand the stages and know when someone is coming out of a complex partial because there can be periods of disorientation afterwards. That does not mean they are in full blown ictal, which is the acute part of the complex acute part of the complex partial seizure. And then they have the differences of seek medical attention for a seizure lasting over five to 10 minutes. That's talking about the ictal portion, the acute portion, where the person is disoriented, they're doing automatisms. But I would say any confusion over 20 minutes, because if they can't assess post-ictally, I'd be seeking some medical attention. Uh, first aid for generalized tonic-clonic, very simple. Remember the T's, turn, time, and tuck. Turn someone on their side, tuck something soft under their head, and time it. No one wears watches anymore. You'd be surprised in a school. And when I tell them, listen, you do not want to be looking at a clock. You do not want to be fumbling for your cell phone because you're going to be nervous. Your, your watch is what's going to keep you calm on your wrist. You can monitor the person at the same time as you are doing the first aid and watching the person. We turn the person on the side. Why? To keep the airway open. People have a lot, can have emesis. They usually bite their tongue, have a lot of salivation. If we keep them on their back, they're going to aspirate, and then you're going to be in trouble. Move any objects that are dangerous. Loosen any restrictive clothing. Uh, stay with the person until they're fully recovered. Things not to do. For a tonic-clonic seizure, don't restrain. Don't put anything in the person's mouth. Of course, I have seen clonopin, oral disintegrating tablets, oral buck ordered buckley for someone in grand mal tonic-clonic seizure. And usually when they're on their side, I usually say the cheek that is up. You can put it in there, but you have to make sure it goes between the cheek and the gum. Hopefully, they'll change their order to diastet or midazolam. Don't give any oral medications when we talk about that. That's swallowing of uh, food or water until they're fully awake. Call 911. Seizure lasts more than five minutes. If you don't know, if they don't have a medical ID bracelet, never assume it's epilepsy because it could be an acute cause, which is life-threatening. If a seizure is followed by another without regaining consciousness, we talked about status epilepticus, and that could be a sign that they're going into it. Person is seriously injured as a result of a seizure. They've gone down in the bathroom, hit their head, never want to take a chance. If it occurs in water, definitely a chance of aspiration if they're diabetic or pregnant. As we know in pregnancy, you can have preeclampsia, which people can have convulsive seizures with that. Hopefully we're not dealing with that. But teens, pregnancy, high, we could. Diabetes, if you have someone who is diabetic and has epilepsy, what's causing the seizure? Do they have a low blood sugar reaction or is it the epilepsy? And if normal breathing does not recur after the seizure ends. Managing stress, I talked about it earlier. We, it's, you can't entirely manage stress, it's around us. It's how we deal with it. Um, have the person keep a journal so they know what's, uh, what is causing them stress. A lot of us can't identify our stressors. Um, Teach the child methods of deep breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, get them into yoga, get them into uh, Tai Chi, anything that could help them uh, get rid of the stress. And if it is a frequently occurring problem, I mean, we have to assess the household too. If, the, if it's, you know, a, a parental conflict that's uh, happening, they, should, they can't avoid that. But how can we deal in with the parents and the child and get them all in counseling to deal with that? Um, they may need to be, depression's very high in our group. They say that 15% of the teens with epilepsy have depression. 
And we really have to assess that, get them into appropriate counseling, appropriate treatment for that. Back to you, Dr. Joshi. So this is the perfect segue for what I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes. In the interest of time, to make sure we leave time for questions, let me go through some aspects of some of the sort of comorbidities around epilepsy, starting with mental health. So next, please, Cindy. Oh, sorry. No, it'll just show how. Uh, so a study done in Detroit actually showed that a third of individuals with epilepsy who were screened, screened positive for, um, for depression. This was using a standardized mood and feelings questionnaire. Now, again, only a third accessed mental health care. So we definitely have this disparity between the problem and what individuals are able to do about it. This is not only pertinent to the Midwest, but a study on the West Coast next showed that even children with the what we call good outcome epilepsy, absence epilepsy, had five times more likelihood of having anxiety or some sort of affective disorder. There is a higher proportion of suicidal ideation. Now, this was done as well as they could, controlling for age, gender, socioeconomic status, IQ, ethnicity. But if you see the odds ratio for suicidal ideation was 12 times among uh, children with epilepsy and who had some underlying psychiatric disorder. Again, very few kids accessed mental health care. Um, what is what also tends to be a very large issue for us, and I can tell you, I spend probably the same amount of time, if not more, at my clinic visits discussing learning problems in children. I like to call them learning differences because not everybody has a documented learning disability. But children with epilepsy are at risk for lower academic achievement, memory problems, worse behavior scores, even kids with good seizure control and who have a normal range IQ on formal neuropsychometric testing. In many kids, the learning problems predate seizures. You know, the question comes up is, is the learning problem because of the medications. And I actually look at this as sort of a kind of a multifaceted problem. You have, you have a brain that makes seizures, that influences learning, that influences behavior. And there's something wrong with the brain that's causing seizures and can therefore cause problems with learning and um, behavior. Medications don't help often, but you cannot solely attribute learning differences to either the seizures or learning problems. Studies have shown that disorganized, unsupported family um, structure and environment can be a bigger factor in learning differences. Uh, next slide, please. Now, next, the biggest behavior learning academic issue that comes up in children with epilepsy is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. I want to give a shout out to all you primary care doctors who treat this in the community because without you, we couldn't do our jobs. Um, it is an independent risk factor for school problems, for injuries, for drug use, for car accidents. And again, the big monkey in the room is do you put these kids on stimulants? Because guess what? All medications, there is this fine print that says stimulants can cause seizures. The bottom line is, next slide. I was going to say too, uh, Dr. Joshi, um, early intervention, a lot of times I see, uh, I do a lot of advocacy in the prison and juvenile courts. Sure. And, and with ADHD and the complex of epilepsy, I have seen that occurring. And if we have early intervention, we could prevent the legal problems that occur. There you go. So the bottom line is stimulants are not contraindicated. Um, methylphenidate and its sort of its cousins are all safe and effective and really can make a big difference in these children's learning, in their self-esteem, in everything. Some of the other um, non-stimulant medications like adamoxetine, guanfacine are also very reasonable pharmacologic alternatives. Next slide. Um, I'll turn it back to you. I guess you've talked a little bit more about this, but go ahead. Okay. Um, yes, definitely. Um, there's another way of dealing with uh, ADHD and school problems, um, and that, that includes uh, the accommodations that they're doing in school. Uh, it's, it's very useful to ask the, the parents and the staff to monitor the school performance because that may be the first indication that we're having problems with side effects of the medication. We may be having early signs of ADHD. We may, they may have to change the medication if it is causing real detriment to their educational uh, performance. Um, a 504 plan. Uh, a 504 plan 
if anyone knows anything about educational advocacy, it's a step before an individualized education plan. And it involves um, the laws that are involved, such as IDEA, the Rehab Act, the ADA Act. All of these are laws that affect education in the schools of children with uh, disabilities. And for a 504 plan, um, a child does not have to qualify. They just have to have a, a disability under the ADA. And epilepsy is a disability according to uh, the American Disabilities Act. Thank you to Tony Coelho, uh, who advocated for that because he has epilepsy, a congressman. Anyways, uh, we look at these things and um, some of the accommodations, I always ask for a 504 before, hand beforehand. We're gonna put that seizure plan as part of the 504 because that's the legal requirement saying that you have to follow this. A lot of schools will say, no, we don't have a nurse here, we're gonna call 911. We're getting away from that. Or they will have to say that the child has to go home after having a seizure. Well, not if he's recuperated. I get schools to tell me that, no, we aren't babysitters. Well, the child isn't sick. We want to get him functioning and back to school. So an accommodation in the 504 plan with the um, seizure plan will prevent those type of unnecessarily steps that are interrupting their educational progression. Um, also, uh, looking at the psychosocial, if they need to be with the counselor, et cetera, uh, behavioral, uh, developing a behavioral plan, possibly if he is having a, a symptoms with his ADHD that are affecting a lot of his learning. Um, bullying monitoring, very terrible. Bullying doesn't have to be face-to-face. -face. It can be out in that playground when that child's not there. And I always tell uh, people that that can have a big impact on to whether the child wants to go to school or not and the protection to put in there. Mandatory staff education. When I talk about mandatory staff education, put it in that 504 because you have to designate the time. Schools do not want to designate time to mandatory health education. They'd rather call 911. I always say an hour and a half of education is mandatory for them and that can include rescue medications, that can include the seizure plan, uh, individualized education on the type of epilepsy that ha child has so they understand that the majority of seizures with epilepsy are non-life threatening or when is an emergency for that child. An IEP. An IEP children have to be tested for in the schools and they have to, um, their disability has to significantly impair their educational performance. That's why they test them with different tests to make sure they qualify. A lot of children with epilepsy don't. Uh, epilepsy is a periodic condition and if they're not experiencing side effects from their medication, the testing day may be great for them and they may do well. Uh, but the parent knows that this, this child is suffering. Um, Usually the child can be classified under a category called uh, other health impairment, OHIP. And this classifies them for special education services, uh, say if the child has uh, speech difficulties, uh, those types of things. If they have coexisting problems that need PT, speech, uh, occupational, those types of things. Uh, neuropsychiatric testing is very important because, as I said, a lot of testing in schools is not specific for the, the neurological effects and the brain effects on learning for children with epilepsy. And we want to definitely pinpoint that by a neuropsychological uh, testing done by a qualified uh, physician, hopefully uh, associated with an epilepsy center. Uh, after that, they develop the IEP plan. Refer parents to learn about special education process. If they don't know about it, they don't know the child's rights, they don't know what they can stick up for and what they cannot. I uh, attend a lot of IEP meetings. So we have a lot of information. Michigan Alliance for Families, MAFF, has a great webinar series that goes anywhere from 504 to IEP to what happens when you're having communication difficulties, reprimanding difficulties in the schools, laws, etc. And start them listening to that when their child is diagnosed with epilepsy because they'll never know when they need accommodation. The Michigan Protection and Advocacy have lawyers to tell them when the schools or any public facility that gets federal funding is not accommodating a child or an adult or anybody with a disability and that is the law. They will tell you what the law is. And then, of course, if the school is not following the plans or the accommodations not giving it, looks good on paper, but they're not doing it. We have, or they disagree, maybe with what you're asking for. Maybe you've asked for a parapro. 
uh, a lot for your child. Not every child needs a Parapro, which is a one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, but if the school isn't giving medication and they don't want to give medication, they refuse, I always say, fine, we're going to ask for a Parapro. And then they start learning, wanting to learn about the medication. But Michigan, MSEMP is the Michigan Special Education Mediation Program, which can help mediate and get the proper accommodations in there when schools disagree with parents or doctors as far as accommodations. Seizure plan is another accommodation, and I went through that before. Dr. Joshi, I'm going to go back to you about driving. All right. So um, in the interest of time, let me go through this quickly. Driving is not permitted when seizures are not controlled, but somebody who has well-controlled epilepsy can drive. It is very important to know what a particular state offers in terms of driving laws uh, because they are widely different. Some states like Michigan state that the seizure-free period means six months. There are places like Arizona where it's much, much longer. Some states require physicians to report to the Secretary of State a good resource is actually the Epilepsy Foundation of America, epilepsyfoundation.org, that has excellent information on driving by state. Uh, Cindy mentioned about you know, parents who have epilepsy and their children have epilepsy. It is important to check if the parent's epilepsy is controlled and if they are driving. We've had some awkward situations in clinic in, with these scenarios. And it's important to talk to the adolescents about how they feel about their inability to drive. That can be the single most comorbid condition for teens with epilepsy. Next. We'll talk a little bit about bone health because epilepsy puts individuals at risk for poor bone mineralization. And with the falls that you can get from a seizure, that's a risk factor for fractures. Next, bone health and epilepsy is a complex sort of equation with vitamin D, calcium, anticonvulsants. As I said, the comorbid neuromotor dysfunction, particularly kids with cerebral palsy. And kids with epilepsy tend to be a little more sedentary than their peers because of the fear of exercise and you know, what seizures can do. So we have found, next slide, okay. that vitamin D insufficiency is quite common. Um, in a study done at University of Michigan, 75% of our clinic cohort of children with epilepsy were, were low in vitamin D. We found that females and overweight um, individuals were at risk, were at greater risk for vitamin D insufficiency. And really no anti-seizure medication was above the law when it came to bone health. And pretty much every type of epilepsy was implicated. Next. So basically, it is good to assess nutritional status, particularly in a primary care setting. You will be surprised at how many children, particularly older ones, drink no or very little milk, barely eat dairy a couple of times a week, and don't take supplemental vitamins. You can refer to your handout to see what we recommend as um, sort of supplementation. This is partly taken from the nephrology uh, group because they see a lot of vitamin D insufficiency also. Next. We should talk about reproductive health because teens with epilepsy, even with the so-called good prognosis epilepsy, are at high risk for unplanned pregnancy. And the anti-seizure medications can make hormonal contraceptives less effective. Um, why we worry about reproductive health is drugs such as valproic acid in particular can cause neural tube defects. And as you know, neural tube defects occur very, very, very early in pregnancy, actually before somebody even knows that she is pregnant. So it is important to know about this in the context of taking anti-seizure medications. Now, um, valproate even today remains the classic treatment for juvenile myoclonic epilepsy and has the highest risk for fetal teratogenicity. So we consider alternatives like levetiracetam or lamotrigine, which carry a slightly lower price tag. I won't say it's zero, but because we worry about reproductive health, particularly fetal health, it is recommended that every woman in childbearing age should be on as much as five milligrams of folic acid per day. Easier said than done. At the very least, it is good to get adolescents taking a prenatal vitamin so they're used to taking a higher amount of folic acid. I was going to say, too, when um, you know, kids are transitioning to adulthood, a good talk uh, about whether you can have a healthy child and when you, if you cannot have a healthy child and things like that are very important. Right. Um, because uh, a lot of them don't talk about 
a lot of now they do, but when I was uh, diagnosed, they didn't talk about those things. So the fear of having children, going through labor, going to work, um, and possibly having a seizure is is something that really needs to be transitioned and talked into. And I would say. Uh, I would say another thing is uh, it is good for them to know and for that, you know, this is that the vast majority of women with epilepsy have absolutely healthy children. Next yes. slide. Good. Um, as we mentioned, there is the whole family angle. The younger, less educated, lower family income mothers tend to be depressed when they have a child with epilepsy. They worry. They worry about behavior problems in the affected child. So talking to, next slide, talking to the parents as to how they're feeling is just as important. It is important to recognize that a depressed parent means a child may have a suboptimal outcome and a lower family function score is a predictor of poor self-image in children with epilepsy. Next slide. As I said, it is very important to ask the mother how she is doing because she really is your insight into how that child and everybody at home is doing. Siblings are not above either, and actually many siblings you know, feel like the other child gets more attention. Some feel like, you know, they feel like their sibling suffers during a seizure. Some feel responsible for a sibling with epilepsy and only half really want to divulge a diagnosis of epilepsy in a sibling to their friends. Um, next slide. So I'm going to move on a little bit to what Cindy mentioned, which is where is a neurologist and epileptologist and are they really different? Epileptology, you could think about as a subspecialty of neurology. So a neurologist is someone who does specialized training in neurology. A child neurologist trains in general pediatrics, then does three years of child neurology residency training, and then is declared board eligible. And for those who have taken past the boards, board certified by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. An epileptologist is one step further. After being fellowship trained in neurology or child neurology, I'm sorry, after being residency trained in child neurology or child uh, or general neurology, an epileptologist has done fellowship. And today the fellowship is very, very specifically worded out for expertise, not only in EEG interpretation, but also diagnosis and management of complex epilepsy and the advanced treatments of complex epilepsy, which we thought were a little bit outside the scope of today's talk. So if anybody has questions, I'm happy to answer them, but I'm not going to be addressing them specifically. And now the ABPN specific board for epilepsy. So epilepsy centers are not just that, you know, here is this fancy hospital that calls itself an epilepsy center. There is a national association of epilepsy centers that has published and established criteria. And I can tell you it's a very onerous process to be certified year after year for a level four epilepsy center certification. So next slide, a level three epilepsy center can provide sophisticated EEG services, Epilepsy surgery in more or less straightforward, here's a lesion, here's a target, causing epilepsy, out it goes. Pharmacological expertise, nursing support, some rehabilitation, and kind of a multidisciplinary approach. On the other hand, a level four epilepsy center takes it one step further, where they can not only do what a level three epilepsy center does, but does much more sophisticated functional cortical mapping by implanting EEG electrodes intracranially. They can do resection of, uh, of seizure focus that is not evident on an MRI scan. And they can do a lot of specialized functional EEG and uh, neuroimaging studies like PET scans or SPECT scans. As I said, this is something that requires special certification. So let's turn to something that nobody likes to talk about, myself included, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. This goes by the acronym SUDEP, and as the definition goes, it is sudden, unexpected, more likely witnessed, but can be witnessed. It's a non-traumatic and non-drowning death, typically in the setting of epilepsy, but there may or may not be evidence for a seizure, but it is not from status epilepticus. And usually post-mortem or autopsy examination does not say that here is what caused the death. It really is unexpected and sometimes unexplained. So there are published criteria for definite SUDEP, possible SUDEP, near SUDEP, or not SUDEP where a clear clause of death is known. 
and uh, the and the risk factors which are really this is the most important thing to know and the one risk factor that i want all of you to take home is the longer the duration of poorly controlled epilepsy, the higher the risk factor risk for SUDEP. So while we are still unraveling the mysteries of SUDEP and looking at, you know, are there biomarkers like EEG patterns that predict somebody is at higher risk, type of epilepsy that puts you at higher risk, the one thing that we can do to reduce the risk of SUDEP in our patients is improve seizure control. If you ever have to sell Medication compliance to anybody with epilepsy, this is why medication compliance is really, really important. It's not only that teens want to drive, but SUDEP is an, is an issue also. Next slide. So the other thing that comes up is, do you really discuss SUDEP or not? Like I said, it's not anything anybody wants to talk about. You want to talk about take your seizure medicines, be seizure free, and you know, let's all live happily ever after. Study after study has shown that especially families who have experienced the unfortunate occurrence of SUDEP, they want to know. They want to know as early as possible in the diagnosis. I have been to any number of talks where, you know, family testimonials have been like, you know, if you tell me my child has cancer, the first thing I'm going to say is what is the mortality over here? They think of epilepsy in the same way. I think it is important to frame SUDEP in it is rare, it is uncommon, it can happen, and this is what we can do to try to prevent it. Um, I am, we were hoping to finish our talk by 1.30. It is 1.41, so let me just tell you about what we're doing in the state of Michigan, particularly pertaining to rural health with telemedicine. So this is a very typical scenario in my clinic. Um, Next slide, a child with intractable epilepsy who drives at least 100 miles one way. I have some kids who drive 400 miles one way from the Upper Peninsula. And coming to see me means missing days of work, missing school. And therefore, actually, Cindy, skip to two slides forward. This is where the telemedicine is very promising and very attractive. And um, next slide. It makes specialty care easier to access. There is reduction in cost for travel, reduction in missed work days, reduction in utilization of tertiary care services because of excellent care coordination between the primary care doctor and the specialist. Next slide. This is pretty much the same thing what I just said. And just to frame it, what we have done is taken telemedicine into the child's medical home, which is for many, if not most children, the primary care physician's office. So telemedicine brings excellent care coordination between the patient and family, primary care physician, and the neurologist, or in my case, the epileptologist. Next slide. Supported by a grant from the Human Resources Services Agreement and the Maternal Child Health Bureau, Michigan has been one of the leaders in telemedicine for pediatric epilepsy. This is our current grant, which was awarded in 2013. As you can see, we have several sites scattered in the Lower Peninsula, as well as in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, where children with epilepsy can connect with their neurologist in a tertiary care or level four epilepsy center. Currently, University of Michigan is the only active epilepsy site, but on the west side of the state, DeVos Children's Hospital has been active in the past and we're hopeful will be active again. There are plans to expand beyond the current existing sites, particularly in areas in the Upper Peninsula, where as Cindy pointed out, there is a paucity of neurologists as well as epileptologists and their ability to connect with patients as well as other epilepsy centers. Yeah, so, they're, they're going to, to uh, uh, Wisconsin, but we're planning on one hopefully in Marquette. And um, that way uh, we have children coming from Marquette already. Right. Though. right. So, uh, so this is where, you know, I look at this as instead of the patient going to medicine, medicine is going to the patient. And this is kind of the modern way of doctors doing house visits. Instead of, you know, it, doctors have always gone to the patient. So this is just our technology-driven modern way of doing that for our patients. Next slide. I was going to say too, Dr. Joshi, you get paid as well as the primary. Correct. So it Correct. is for children so, with 
Uh, Cindy, should we just skip over these yeah, slides, which, which the audience, audience can read? Go through hands. this. Go through this. Need some time for questions. Parent advocacy, I think. But this is a little bit about us. Is um, some of our programs, Camp Discovery, Education Consultation. I do that individualized. Individual advocacy, I do it for all areas, legal employment, uh, public education. I go into schools because we have no schools, bus drivers, classmates, police, EMS, employers. But we have your learn and share conference calls every month. We have a conference uh, November that Dr. Joshi is usually a part of. And we also have social programs. So it's a well-rounded uh, nonprofit that serves all people with epilepsy throughout the state. There's our website. Please visit our website. We have a lot of informational education on there, a lot of forms, a lot of things that parents and uh, people with epilepsy might uh, find helpful. And then our 1-800 number. So uh, one last thing I want to say is anybody hey, that is the I think I, we just want to say thank you right. to all of you. We want yeah. to say thank you to all of you. Next slide, Cindy. Um, and let's get some questions. I don't know how, uh, is Victoria going to facilitate that? Yes. Okay. Um, good. Oh, sorry. Hello, everybody. Um, that's still on the line. We're going to open the lines now for questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to um, either chat them in, put them into the chat box or I will unmute the, all of the lines and you can feel free to ask your question verbally. Thank you. So all the lines are now are unmuted. Please be mindful of your conversation and um, ask your question. Hello. Do we have any questions or comments? I have other lines of you. So, or you can use the chat feature. Yes, and please enter, identify who is asking the question. <laughs> or you can also to use the raise your hand feature too, and I can also identify you that way. One thing I wanted to say, anybody in the rural area who's interested in the telemedicine or getting a child in the telemedicine program, um, please contact the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, uh, number 517-241-5071. And um, Marsha Franks is the director of that. So please, um, we'd like to see more children with epilepsy, see more specialists and getting more comprehensive care, especially out in those rural areas. Um, I have a question here. It's from Diane Smith. She would like to know what VNS stimulation is. Ah, okay. Say, no, I'm sorry. Can you, can you repeat the question? What stimulation? VNS stimulation? VNS, yes. the vagus okay. nerve stimulator. Happy to answer that question. So VNS stands for vagus nerve stimulation. This is a pacemaker-like device that is implanted on the left side of the chest. There is an electrode that tunnels underneath the skin and makes contact with the left vagus nerve. It is not, it is not FDA approved for implantation on the right, only on the left. And there is a pre-programmed electrical signal that a generator in the, uh, I guess, in the pacemaker-like unit uh, sends out. It travels through the electrode, into the vagus nerve, into the brain, and over time disrupts seizure circuits. Now the programming needs to be done by somebody who knows how to do it. Usually epileptologists, some neurologists can do it. And um, in about a third of individuals with difficult to treat seizures, it makes seizures noticeably better. 
it does not require taking a medication every day so it does not have those sedating cognitive memory side effects it is not without side effects also particularly individuals with sleep apnea can have a worsening of their sleep apnea from vagus nerve stimulation um, there may be some benefits on mood also, but that is not necessarily the reason to use a vagus nerve stimulator. The other benefit of the vagus nerve stimulator is parents are taught to actually manually activate the vagus nerve stimulator using a magnet where they swipe a magnet over the, the just from the outside of the body. You don't have to take off clothes or anything, but you just swipe the magnet and that activates the vagus nerve stimulator to sort of zap the give you an extra round of stimulation and sometimes that can be like a rescue medicine for a seizure in some individuals thank you do we have any other questions or comments from anybody could you repeat the phone number for the telemedicine? Sure. Um, 517-241-5071. And if you, if you go on Google and, and just look for Michigan Telemedicine uh, Children and Youth with Epilepsy, you'll get a lot of information on it and, and through the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. All right. Any, do we have any other questions or comments? Okay. We don't have any other questions or comments, or if you can think of them later, um, you could indicate them in your evaluation, and I will I will pass them along to Cindy and uh, we will get them answered for you. I will won't take up any more of your time, and thank you. For Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yoshi, and thank you, Cindy, for being. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us.